don't have a British economic model, we have an economic muddle. The world economy is now in slowdown. Investors see more gains in the short term. People are suffering. Must get Brexit done. Prosperity is not an economic necessity, it's a political choice. The global economy is at a delicate moment. It's just not in the first year. Consumption led growth. Well, climate crisis. Automation. Another recession. Rent and housing costs. Fundamental challenges. 2020 is a us, and now we have a wonderful opportunity to move forward together. Hello, I'm Karis Roberts, and welcome to the IPPR Economic Justice Podcast, the podcast that looks at the broken economy and ideas to achieve prosperity and justice from the UK's leading progressive think tank. The UK economy needs fundamental reform, but how do we get there? Drawing on IPPR research and expertise, plus special guests. The podcast is a space to focus on the major issues and opportunities facing the UK economy. This episode, we're looking at reforming the taxation of wealth and its returns, the income it generates. In this episode, we'll be talking about how the tax system treats different types of income differently, how this disproportionately benefits the wealthy, and how these problems can be fixed. So from IPPR, we're joined by economist Shreya Nandler. Hello. And we're delighted to be joined by Danny Sri Skandaraja, the Chief Executive of Oxfam GP, to discuss this with us today. Hello. So I wanted to kick off really uh, with you, Shreya, and I wanted to ask you to talk us through the basics of this topic. So how do we tax wealth currently and what does this mean for inequality? So right now, uh, we can think about receiving income in two different forms. So there's like your ordinary people who go out to work and earn their income that way. And then there's people who own assets such as shares and earn their income from owning wealth. So, for example, you can earn income in the form of capital gains when your shares go up in value, or you can earn dividend income when you when companies pay out dividends on your shares. And those forms of income are taxed differently. So, for example, if you go out to work and you earn £100,000, you'll pay £33,000 of that in tax. But if you earn £100,000 in capital gains, you'll only pay £14,000 of that in tax. So people are paying different amounts of tax depending on how they earn their income. And that obviously affects wealth inequality because it means that people who are already wealthy um, end up paying less tax than people who have to earn their income by working. And this benefits the wealthy more as they're more likely to own shares and assets. And this might become more of a problem over time as the returns to capital increase. Okay, and in terms of that distribution of who has wealth, could you spell out some of some of that difference? Does everyone have dividends? Does everyone make capital gains? Or how split is that? So the um, yeah, the vast amount of capital gains are earned by people who are in the higher or top income tax brackets. The people who are already wealthy. So it's pe- it's those people who are likely to earn a much bigger proportion of their income from capital gains and dividends. Danny, I wonder if I could turn to you. Why is wealth inequality on the agenda at the moment? Why are we talking about this? Well, I think the world is talking about inequality more generally because of of, how, of this sort of eye-watering levels of inequality and inequity we're seeing around the world, both in terms of income, but also increasingly attention is being paid to this very unfair distribution of wealth that, that Trey is talking about. So I think there is a, a, a certainly a, a sort of right, a, a public consciousness about the sort of unjust distribution of resources in society, not you know, across the world, um, is rising. You know, when I first started um, sort of my university degree working on economics, the overwhelming concern for most of us um, was the distribution of, of, of income and wealth um, between countries. You know, there were very rich countries and very poor countries in the world, and that felt unfair, and that's why people like me got involved in international development, for example. But today, if I look around the world, it, you know, we're seeing rising levels of inequality within countries, um, and uh, that you know, if, in some ways, if the world were one country, it would be the most unequal country in the world, mm-hmm. because it's what's happening is there are very few people, small numbers of elites, of economic elites, who've managed to accumulate huge amounts of, of, of wealth, um, and have have deepened um, uh, their sort of controls on key bits of the economy and have um, their wealth just keeps growing. Um, and if you, do, if you miss that by just looking, for example, at, at the, the distribution between countries, you'll miss that sort of that, um, that really important part of this puzzle. 
Australia's talked a bit about the gap within the UK uh, between people at the top and people with less. That picture is more stark at the global level, right? What kind of differences are we talking about? Yeah. I mean, look, Oxfam research has shown um, that, for example, 1% of the world's population owns half of all wealth that just a handful of billionaires, almost all of whom are men, own more wealth than half the world's population put together, uh, or the poorest half of the world's population put together. So, you know, we are in an era in which there's been such rapid uh, gains to the the sort of wealthy. Um, If you look at um, someone like um, um, uh, George Soros or Warren Buffett, um, even the levels of accumulation of wealth that they've had in recent years has sort of skyrocketed um, as, um, you know, as their sort of uh, investments mature. So the, so the wealthier get wealthier because of the, sort of the differential rates at which their, their wealth, the income from their wealth is being taxed. Mm-hmm. Um, and that uh, seems unfair. And, you know, what, an organisation like Oxfam, which, you know, works on, on trying to relieve poverty, um, has spent most of our 70 odd years trying to you know, make interventions to help people to relieve poverty, to increase the life chances and the livelihoods of people at the bottom of, 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 the, of the distribution pile. But what's becoming increasingly clear to us is that extreme poverty today doesn't exist just because of scarcity. It exists in part, it's driven by the unfair distribution of resources. That unless, you know, even World Bank research now shows that you could have continued economic growth, but unless you have a redistribution of resources, we won't be able to tackle extreme poverty effectively. That, you know, the, the, the poorest um, uh, half of the world's population, um, their wealth actually dropped by 11% last year. Meanwhile, the sort of billionaires in the world, their wealth increased by 12%, 2.5 billion US dollars a day. And so we live in a world where if we care about the poorest people on the planet, if we care about leaving no one behind, then we have to tackle all forms of of inequality. But increasingly, I think we have to pay some more attention to wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. So growing the pie is not enough to resolve poverty. You have to also work on how to split the pie more fairly, effectively. Exactly. And um, who are these people at the top? Where are they making their money from? I think a lot of people at the top are, are, um, are own huge amount of, of shareholdings in, in different industries. There's obviously the, um, the, the, the internet billionaires who've, um, who've done spectacularly well by, you know, um, by you know, admittedly um, contributing huge amounts to the, to the real economy through you know, companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon have made the world in many ways a better place because they, you know, the digital transformation that's around us has has empowered a lot of people, has changed people's lives, has improved people's lives. But with it has come, um, again, staggering, unimaginable levels of wealth accumulation um, that are ahistorical in some ways. Even the wealthiest barons and monarchs in human history, historical terms, would never have had accumulated this amount of of resources compared to the rest of um, uh, of the population. And I do worry that we're hurtling into an era where that social contract between the, ex- the wealthy and the rest of, their, uh, of the population is incredibly fragile. You know, you could imagine that in most of human history, there were always rich people, people had more, um, but they tended to live together cheek by jowl with the people that didn't have as much. And that gave rise to a social contract where those who had wealth were, you know, had an obligation or felt an obligation to share to, to, um, to make sure that no one was being left behind. But what seems to be happening today with the sort of rise of globalization and, and sort of the, the digital economy in particular is that immediacy, that contact between the people who are making the sort of extreme profits um, are far away from the people who aren't getting the sort of, are, are, are not getting, but you know, a good example is, you know, if you think about a, a, a mini cab company in the past, you know, the, the owners of a minicab company might have been making good money servicing their community, but by being in that community, they probably would have invested in, you know, in, in, in associations, clubs, and community projects, and felt like citizens and wanting to be part of part of that community. But if you take an Uber, for example, or any of these sort of big um, ride-hailing apps, what seems to be interesting to me is that you've got 
this sort of there is a, a much more intimate relationship. You know, if you use one of these apps, you feel like you know a lot about your the driver. That's that, you know you've got you've got a much more intimate relationship. But the people who are making money from that process ultimately are far far away. Are faceless um, people who you don't know much about and who don't know much about you. Mm-hmm. And so, in in some ways, sort of global digital capitalism has um, has created these you know fantastic services. But it's disrupting, I worry, the sort of social contract that bound um, um, people together. We've seen this public debate about whether billionaires should exist recently. And I think what that comes down to is partly whether you think it is possible for a billionaire to deserve the, the wealth that they get, or indeed to have kind of contributed that value to the company uh, economy, or whether, in fact, uh, that, that wealth is almost unearned. And it comes down to this quite techy concept of economic rent. Shreya, I wonder if you could explain what an economic rent is and how it relates to this topic. So an economic rent, when we say an economic rent, what we mean is um, income that's earned not by adding any value to the economy, right? Like not producing anything new, but just by owning something or, or taking something. So for example, if you own a piece of land, you haven't produced that land, that land was, was already there, but you're earning an income of it. So it's, it's earning money without growing the size of the economic pie. So, and the FT, for example, has done a series recently on how the economy has become more rentierized. So, yeah, I think there is a case to be made that a lot of the people who are earning huge amounts at the moment aren't doing it solely through their own productiveness, but are doing it by taking money from the rest of the economy. Mm-hmm. What's fascinating about the billionaire question for me is that... Um, my colleagues in Oxfam America work very closely with something called the Patriotic Millionaires Initiative. And this is a group, a growing number of very rich American um, billionaires and millionaires who are actively campaigning for higher rates of tax, including wealth tax, mm. because they feel um, that it's unjust that they've been allowed to accumulate such wealth. And they, these are entrepreneurs, these are self made people, these are not anti capitalist ideologues. These are people who feel that there is a moral problem with the fact that they have been allowed to accumulate at such, um, such levels. And of course, couple that with many billionaires who are signing up to things like the Giving Pledge, you know, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, George Soros, are all people who've said that they will give away the vast proportion of the wealth that they've accumulated while they live and not pass it on. In, in two. That's all great. But in some ways, both of those initiatives beg the question, well, why don't we as a society um, come up with better ways of pre-redistributing that wealth and accumulation. Pre-distribution, yes. that uh, favourite word of UK policy. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, why, why do we need to leave it to um, the enlightened billionaires to call for more wealth tax mm-hmm. or redistribute their income and wealth after they've accumulated mm-hmm. instead of having a, a, a sort of slightly different societal approach in which we as, as, you know, as, as social beings who come together, who want to shape societies together, have a, a, a redraw that equation by which um, resources are shared. And of course, if a billionaire is able to redistribute their money by donating it, they get to choose how that is distributed, don't they? Whereas, I guess, part of the purpose of taxation and collective spending is that that is democratically decided over who benefits. And in, in the international development case, that's you know extremely um, um, visible because some of the most important donor initiatives in international development, fighting extreme poverty or fighting malnutrition, come from the wealth of rich individuals. And they've said, you know, they want to spend their own money fighting global poverty. But that seems crazy in a world of plenty where we could end extreme poverty tomorrow if we just allocated resources differently. We're now leaving it to the goodwill of of billionaires to do that. That seems both unjust, but also um, suboptimal. And of course, the wealth that we're talking about will be passed on, uh, not just in terms of donations, but to future generations. So here in the UK, on a kind of more domestic scale, even though some measures of wealth inequality show that it hasn't kind of increased drastically in recent years, the amounts of wealth that we're talking about have gone up quite drastically. So I think the, the latest uh, survey suggests that there's over £14 trillion pounds of wealth in this country, it's gone up a lot over the past decade. And that means that if that's been passed on to some in, uh, younger generations and not others, 
inheritance of that, if it becomes more important. I want to turn now to talk a little bit about one of the major levers that we have to try and adjust the situation, and that is the tax system. How can we use the tax system to tackle these problems? Trey, I wonder if you could start. So we at IPPR have proposed to tax income from wealth the same as income from work. So what that would mean would be that um, instead of having separate taxes, capital gains tax and dividend tax, you tax all of those kinds of income in the same way as income from earnings. So you'd have the same tax rates and you get rid of the separate tax reliefs and tax allowances for those types of income. And then there's also, as you've just talked about, the issue of inheritance tax. So IPPR, we've also proposed a lifetime gifts tax, which instead of taxing based on the income of the person leaving the inheritance, would tax it on the basis of the income of the person receiving the inheritance. So overall, it's fairer and the tax rates would be higher. If I'm a, an ordinary person here in the UK, how would you persuade me that the right thing to do is to tax those things equally? I mean, surely if I've saved and I've um, bought a second property, then that's mine, right? You shouldn't, ha- you shouldn't tax it. I'm playing devil's advocate here, of course, but could you? what do you say to that person? I think it's, it's just about thinking somebody who, who earns their money through working is paying these tax rates. So it seems like a basic case of fairness that you'd expect people who are rich enough not to have to work to pay the same tax rates. And we also know that if we um, spread tax rates more evenly over the economy, then essentially all taxes um, have some level of um, cost. And the more evenly taxes are spread, the less cost there'll be for each individual tax. Could it be avoided? What's it, how does this tie into the avoidance debate? So the, that's a really key part of the reason why we think that we should make these changes. So um, currently the tax system with different rates of tax for different kinds of income means that it makes it easier for rich people to avoid tax by saying, well, instead of taking my money as earnings, I'll, um, I'll choose to take it as capital gains or as interest or as dividends. So this would reduce tax avoidance and stop people from avoiding income tax in that way. So, Danny, we've had there a few proposals, taxing income from wealth, same as income from work, a lifetime gift tax, uh, various different approaches. What, what's the Oxfam position on this? Well, I think it will be up to each government, each society, in a way, to find what's the right mix of, uh, of tax um, for, for that time, for that society. And, but I think what, what we're seeing is that it does seem wrong that only 4% of the global tax take comes from wealth taxes. So 4p out of every pound collected around the world in taxes comes from one, some form of wealth tax. But for all the reasons that Shreya has said, you know, we live in an era where wealth accumulation, especially um, from the sort of economic rents that you're, um, you've identified, has transformed the sort of the landscape of who, who's well off and who's not. And so in some ways, we think the tax system globally has to catch up. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially at a time when we know, again, if we come back to sort of questions of poverty and how we make the world a, a, a fairer place, that just, you know, just a few hundred billion dollars, yes, that sounds like a lot, but globally, just a few hundred billion dollars put into effective public services in the global south could it end extreme poverty. It would mean that people just, you know, just don't, have, don't die unnecessarily because they just don't have enough. And that's so a slight tweak to the sort of distribution of resources and, and, and the collection of tax could make a huge difference. And it seems obvious that increasing or adapting some form of wealth tax was an obvious way to go. And each country, of course, needs to design exactly how that's done. But, you know, coming back to your point, Karis, around, you know, how do we tell the story and convince someone? Um, the, the good news here is all the polling evidence I've seen, especially in the UK, suggests that people are interested and would support um, higher forms of, of, of tax so I think two thirds or more than two thirds of British people in a recent survey thought that earnings from wealth should be taxed at the same level as those um, from income. And about half of people surveyed suggested a, a model similar to that one was being rolled out in Spain around having a net wealth tax mm-hmm. that um, for people who own over about 750,000, who have more than 750,000 pounds or so in net wealth. Of course, minus their, their home and their, uh, their pensions, if they have this extra level of, of wealth, that um, in, in Spain there is a regime to, to increase the sort of net wealth tax. 
And interestingly, half of British people support something like that. And so I think there is this, we are living in an era where it's not popular support, and nor is it seem to be a question of, of, of political, it's not so easy to say that this is you know a, 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 an issue that's owned by a particular party or not. I mean, it was Boris Johnson when he was campaigning to be the leader of the Conservative Party said that the fundamental moral purpose of government was to bridge wealth and opportunity gaps within the UK. So there seems to be, at least uh, in the sort of in, in campaigning terms, a commitment from across the political spectrum to do something about this very urgent and important problem. We have seen in the Conservative 2019 manifesto, it does actually say we will review how to end the arbitrary differences in taxation on the wealthy and non wealthy. I mean, I think personally I'd want to see some hard commitments there. But yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things that I find in this debate is that the opponents of taxing wealth properly say, well, look around the world. Um, No country has successfully raised a large amount of revenue from this particular policy. And indeed, some countries have kind of rode back from their positions. That seems to me to be kind of suggesting that we should set our bar at the lowest common denominator. And, you know, a lot of those countries would have been captured by the interests of the wealthy who have been lobbying against these kinds of taxes for a long time. How do we win that argument? And can it be one in one country? Or does this need to be a kind of international effort? I think there definitely needs to be international collaboration. Because the risk is, of course, as we've seen with corporate tax or even individual income taxes, that people will fall and shop, will go to where the lowest tax regime is. And, you know, as we know, some of the biggest companies of the world have made an art of finding the most tax effective way of, of locating their businesses or reporting where they are doing business. And what we don't want is a system where countries that want to do the right thing suffer because people just take their wealth somewhere else. So I think some form of global collaboration seems timely now, whether that's done at the sort of OECD level for rich countries. And there is interest, I hear, from the OECD to do more in this or, or through some form of truly global collaboration. But I think that will be a, a necessary first step to make sure that we prevent this sort of uh, free riding, race, race to the bottom in some ways, um, mm-hmm. and encourage a race to the top, if you will, or a race to a, a common standard or basic minimum. So I think that's that's important, um, and we, you know, it, it's this is the lesson we surely must learn in other a- aspects of, of the fact that you know money capital flows so freely across the globe these days, and uh, this idea that somehow one nation state can control it, regulate it, tax it effectively, just isn't working. And so you know we do need to just get much better at collaborating across this. And the, again, across the world, evidence suggests that people want, are calling out for this. You know, that surely has to be a lesson of this era as, as public consciousness about inequality, and the uh, sort of unjust nature of inequality is rising. Politicians all over the world need to catch up and come up with cleverer, more effective systems for delivering on these promises because the social fabric is, a, is straining all around the world as a result of these deepening um, inequalities. So Danny mentioned some polling showing that two-thirds of people in the, in the UK, I think that was, support and taxing income from wealth at least as much as income from work. That was actually polling that we did. So. Do you think that the, the tide is turning here? What are the main barriers to getting consensus across the political spectrum? And is that possible? Um, yeah, I think, I think from that it's clear that public opinion is behind this. As you mentioned, the Conservatives have alluded to this in their manifesto. Um, the Labour Party has, and the Green Party have adopted it as policy and the Lib Dems have previously spoken about adopting it as policy. Um, I know that from people on the right side, the right of the political spectrum, there's some interest in it, but um, a feeling that it should be a revenue neutral rather than a revenue raising thing. And there's also the issue, so the, the Institute for Fiscal Studies have suggested that the tax changes should be accompanied by the introduction of a rate of return allowance, which would mean that the the normal return to wealth would be tax-free. So they see that as a way of stopping the tax from uh, discouraging investment. So that seems like a necessary condition to make the measures more palatable across the political spectrum. So that's one of the big worries people have, isn't it? You know, is this going to discourage investment? Is it going to discourage the people who have capital and have wealth from coming to the countries to implement it? 
What should we be saying in response to those criticisms? We know that this um, measure would be good for the economy. We know that it would spread wealth more equally, which we know is necessary for a strong economy. As Danny has been saying, the, the issues about the straining of the social contract, like the, the way that we are now is unsustainable. If we carry on like this, we won't be able to fund our public services. So I think that all of those are ways of making the case to persuade people that this is a necessary measure. And I mean, there's plenty of evidence, isn't there, from all kinds of radical institutions like the OECD and IMF <laughs> who, that show that actually a fairer economy is a stronger economy, that actually if you can have a more equal economy, you're less likely to see these big sort of rushes on certain assets that create bubbles and create instability in the system. And that if you spread wealth further down the income distribution, then actually people will spend a greater proportion of that and spend it locally. So... I mean, I feel like that that is slowly sinking into the consciousness. Certainly on the global level, the tide has turned. You know, I think the World Bank and the IMF, as you say, are, are moving to a new consensus that says that economic growth alone will not deliver the end to extreme poverty and that redistribution or tackling inequality is a far more efficient way of achieving a, re- a more dramatic reduction on, on extreme poverty or, or just poverty more generally. So I think the consensus is moving at least in the in the sort of evidence space, and we just need politicians and others to catch up. Sort of zooming back out to the bigger picture, what does this all mean in terms of the international picture of inequality and what we can do about it in the future? Well, I think, you know, I worry that our era in human history is going to be marked by this sort of hurtling levels, eye-watering, vulgar levels of inequality that the world has seen, you know, just at a coming at the end of an era where we thought we were making great progress on on, um, poverty, on equality within and between countries, we've sort of unleashed this new era where inequality is rising. And one of the things that that strikes me is this this comes together neatly um, with questions of intergenerational justice. You know, just as on the climate agenda, we're trying to think about what does intergenerational justice mean about you know, our generation eating up too much resource and, and harming the chances and, uh, of future generations, I, I worry that wealth inequality is much the same. It's the same dilemma, which is how can we live in a world where um, we aren't giving fair chances to people who happen to be born to a family that's poor, to a family that hasn't been able to accumulate same levels of wealth. Um, you know, one of the first things I did when I started my job at Oxfam was to go and visit our programs in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, one of the poorest countries in the world, um, which is likely to stay poor. Something like one in 10 extremely poor people is going to live in the DRC in 10 years' time, even though it's one of the richest countries in the world when it comes to natural resources, $27 trillion worth of known resources sitting below the ground. And to me, what was sort of most worrying was, you know, I'm, there was no shortage of entrepreneurial, amazing people who were doing really cool things and working hard. That spirit that we want to celebrate is there in ample supply. But those people I met, had the privilege of meeting, are so unlikely to have, to achieve the sort of levels of, of income or accumulation um, that we see around the world just because they were unlucky enough to be born in the DRC today. Um, And I think if we really do think we are a sort of civilised species, then we have to do something to correct the injustice that even in 2019, just because of who, you you know, where you're born or what family you were born into, your life chances are still so shaped by that and not by your own ability or the hard work that you're willing to put in. And talking about intergenerational justice, this ties very much into the climate crisis, doesn't it? So both in terms of who is creating the carbon emissions that are getting us into the problem, but also in terms of who is going to have to suffer from those consequences. I think, is it Peter Thiel who wants to, um, who, or proposed a kind of a separate island where the super rich could go and essentially <laughs> set up fences to block out everybody else who's going to be suffering under the climate crisis and migrating. Elon Musk has got plans to go to Mars, you know, yeah. the super rich will be fine. Apparently there's been a complete rush on land in New Zealand because it's going to be the safest place. And that just feels particularly unjust as well. No, uh, and especially in two ways, I think, at least. One is this idea that 
you know, Oxford, again, Oxfam research has shown that the live the lifestyles of the richest ten percent of the world's population account for fifty percent of all emissions of carbon emissions. So it is, you know, very much a case where the richest are consuming beyond their means, our means, um, in some ways. Um, but also that if you think about those tri- billions that are sitting in bank accounts of some of the world's richest people, those in, in many cases. That wealth is there not just because of rent-seeking behavior or, or economic rents, but because of the extraction of, the, of natural resources. And, you know, again, what's unfair is that those externalities, the cost, the true costs of exploitation of that oil or that coal um, or those trees or that timber, um, have been borne by the planet and future generations, but the private gains sit in those people's bank accounts. And that's wrong on both fronts, on both the wealth terms and the climate justice terms. So Piketty proposed a global wealth tax. Um, now, given our current politics and uh, political leaders, including Trump, that feels quite far off. But what do you think? Is it possible in our lifetimes? Well, I think as you've been talking about issues in the international system, it's well, you can see that where there's not where people don't make an effort to make the system more just, it will just tend to the people who have the most getting more and the people who have the least getting nothing. So it's quite clear that we need to do something about it. And I think that, you know, as the political situation gets more unstable, maybe that will bring about more of an impetus for change. I think it's possible and I I fear it's also necessary that, you know, we aren't going to solve these issues by one country acting alone. So therefore we have to have a global approach. We have global standards on a whole range of other things in public life. And so why not uh, some form of standard um, taxing system so that there is, um, you know, there's less opportunity for, for, for rich people to exploit differences in regimes around the world, but also that we have, this is a global approach to this global challenge. Um, and we need more of that sort of effective collaboration if it's going to, to work. Well, I like that as an optimistic note to end on. Huge thank you to Danny Sri Skandaraja and Shreya Nanda for joining us. And thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. To find out more about these topics and the work of the Centre for Economic Justice, visit ippr.org forward slash CEJ. Whatever platform you're listening to this on, subscribe to make sure you catch all episodes of the IPPR Economic Justice podcast. And if you found this discussion useful and think others will too, please do share it. We also really appreciate reviews, comments and questions. We'll read them all. Thank you.